Hi all, this is Akshra Menon from Famous Bazaar. I am thrilled to welcome you all to today's webinar on the topic, The Snowball Effect and Changing Styles of Investing. From this webinar, one can understand two major companies, the quality investing focus and long-term investment mindset, which one can uh, create power, uh, powerful compounding. But given that this webinar also focuses on how reinvesting returns helps your investment to grow faster, just like a snowball gathering more snow when it rolls down the hill. We will also delve into the topics such as the return on the quality as an investing style and also behavioral biases that explains the quality's underperformance over financial year 2124. Now let me introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Siddharth Botra. Siddharth is the fund manager of Ambit Coffee Can Portfolio at Ambit Asset Management and brings over 25 years of experience in the investment and equity research. Before joining Ambit, he has spent 18 years at Motilal Oswald Financial Services. At Motilal Oswald Asset Management, he played a crucial role in launching and growing their active mutual fund, uh, taking it from zero to an impressive 220 billion INR of a year. He managed various funds, including Focus Large Cap 25 and Aggressive Hybrid Fund, overseeing around 150 billion INR at his peak. Remarkably, his funds consistently ranked in top 10 of all the cat respective categories on a long-term performance. To talk on his educational background, Siddharth is an alumnus of Indian School of Business, Hyderabad, and also completed an MBA exchange semester at New York Stern School of Business. His deep uh, belief in long-term compounding aligns perfectly with Ambit Asset Management's investment philosophy, emphasizing quality uh, and a long-term investment goals. Thank you for joining us today, sir. Before giving it to the speaker, I would request the participants not to ask any stock-specific questions and kindly put your questions on the Q&A box. Before uh, getting started this exciting session, I would, I would want to ask you one question, sir. You, have, you are from a very strong, active MF background, and now you're handling PMS. What differences are you seeing in terms of fund management, and why is this transition? Yeah, uh, so firstly, uh, thank you, Akshara. Thanks, uh, PMS Bazaar, for having me here. And uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, uh, delighted to be able to, uh, you know, have you all for this call. Uh, so, uh, you know, Akshara, the thing is, I wanted to get into, uh, you know, something where I could actually practice what I love more, which is more long term investing. And I feel uh, that, uh, you know, a, a PMS platform where uh, you have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the investor side, you have more people, you know, who are more long term oriented. And uh, uh, I think the, you know, the investor, uh, the kind of investors you find in PMS to some extent uh, is, uh, uh, you know, to an extent more sophisticated. And uh, they are able to understand the benefits of, uh, uh, you know, the topic that we are discussing, which is a snowball effect on investing and how long term investing is necessary. And uh, I felt, uh, uh, you know, this, this, uh, the PMS route is a better way, PMS AIF route is a better way to kind of uh, practice what I believe in. I wouldn't like to take much of your time, sir. So can over to you. Great. Thank you so much. So friends, uh, you know, as uh, Akshara mentioned, there are two topics that you are uh, trying to discuss in this call. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, on the snowball effect on investing, which essentially is, I think, the cornerstone of investing. We all know that, uh, you know, investing is nothing but the magic of compounding. And, uh, uh, you know, when you are talking in terms of five years, 10 years, uh, the only way you can have compounding is if you also integrate quality within that. Uh, uh, you, you cannot have compounding if you're not buying quality stocks or, you know, if you're trying to shuffle too much or uh, churn a lot uh, in the stocks. The other thing I wanted to discuss in this call is uh, uh, with regard to uh, the cycles that we have in the um, investing, uh, you know, just like uh, markets go through cycles of bull, bear and, uh, you know, sometimes stagnant markets. Similarly, uh, over the years, you know, what happens is investing styles keeps changing. So these are the two topics which, you know, I wanted to kind of dwell on and, uh, uh, you know, I have a small presentation. I try and, uh, you know, uh, cover some of my points in the next 20, 25 minutes. And then, uh, you know, open up the platform for uh, questions from your side. So, uh, you know, I start off with the point on return of quality. Uh, to do that, you know, uh, the point I was trying to make here is that uh, 
the investing that we have seen you know uh, post covid like if you look at the markets post covid from say uh, you know cy 2021 to uh, uh, you know maybe the early, uh, you know somewhere in the march uh, april of this year what we have seen is that you know after the sharp collapse uh, around the covid time uh, the rebound has been something you know which has been uh, led primarily uh, from cy 21 uh, uh, or fy 22 onwards by very high beta uh, you know uh, very high deep cyclicals and also uh, sectors which you would not ordinarily uh, uh, you know kind of associate with wealth creation and uh, uh, the last two three years has been to my mind an anomaly in terms of uh, uh, you know what we have seen in the market and i feel now we have several triggers visible uh, which showcases that you know this is changing and investors would do uh, better to you know kind of shift their focus from uh, you know riding this uh, uh, sharp recovery uh, market that we had seen in the last two three years to more uh, focus on capital protection and again a shift back to quality i'll come back to you on why quality and uh, in my subsequent uh, uh, slides to you know just start off with uh, uh, when we say quality outperformance uh, so, you know, if you look at the quality side, this is a data that is uh, there. This is on the US market because there you can get data for, you know, 40, 50 years. So this data goes back from, you know, as, as, as much as like 30, 40 years here. And they have analyzed the US market across various times. And uh, they have basically divided into three, which is the percentage of outperforming periods, uh, the best outperformance and the worst outperformance. So what this data, uh, you know, which comes up, there's a research paper on this, which is uh, also available if you go to this site, which is Kenneth French uh, data library, you would get all these data. So on the quality side, they've seen versus any other style, quality on a percentage of outperforming period has been like 88%. Now, uh, where it lags is in the best outperformance, uh, you know, this is amongst the lower, which is 3.1, whereas, you know, when on a rebound, uh, the other segments do better. But where quality gets its alpha is when the underperformance comes in or, you know, when markets correct, which is the worst underperformance for quality is just around 1.5. Whereas for all other segments, it is much higher, especially for size, which, you know, when I size, I mean the small mid cap and so on. And even if you look at the other uh, segments, which is the low volatility or the value segments. So uh, they then, you know, further went and divided the market over the last 30 years, 35 years into cycles uh, like you know they called it the recovery cycle the expansion cycle uh, the slowdown phase and the contraction phase what they uh, you know uh, came out of that study is that quality as a uh, uh, you know style outperform across all cycles whether it be recovery whether it be slowdown whether it be the contraction period the only period where it underperforms is the expansion phase when expansion phase i mean to uh, you know come back to the Indian market, say a period between 91 to 93, 94, or, you know, the period between 2003, 4 to 2007, or maybe, you know, in India, when we saw the period uh, of mid and small between say 16, 17. So these, these are, you know, some of the periods where the market is in a very sharp upswing or a very high beta rally. And typically those kind of markets last for roughly around two years to, you know, two and a half, three years. And that's the phase where quality in a way underperforms. And, uh, you know, to my mind, we have seen that phase behind us and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, going forward, I think the focus, as I mentioned, uh, will again come back to quality and capital uh, uh, protection. So, you know, let's again come back to I did, uh, uh, you know, mention that, you know, if you look at the last two, three years, the sectors which have driven the kind of rally has been more high beta and uh, uh, this has been also driven by very deep cyclicals. So at our Ambit Research, they do a deep study where, you know, they have this proprietary model where uh, on the accounting side, they take the entire, uh, uh, the BSE 500 companies and on basis of 10 factors, which, uh, you know, goes from uh, accounting factors to, cap you know, your capital allocation factors to your governance factors, and also, you know, how has been your returns and growth. And they divide it in uh, 10 deciles, uh, deciles, which is from D1 to D10. And typically, if you look, uh, you know, uh, in any period in the market, the whole investing logic is that, you know, if you can avoid the 
decile 7 to 10 which is you know very poor quality companies poor quality management you automatically end up outperforming but what we have seen in the last 12 months uh, is that you know these d9 d10 these are the segments you have seen maximum outperformance happening here so when i say quality underperformed in the last 2 3 years it's because you know if you look uh, the the you know the key ones like d1 d2 they they have not done that well compared to the companies in this segment this is also visible if i were to look at the returns the sectors have given in the last one year so some of the uh, sectors which have done best in the last uh, one year or even if i take this two three year period is say particularly for the last year has been reality has been the entire psu pack has been the energy sector has been uh, you know the high beta one like uh, small cap the metals and if you look the nifty 50 which is a large cap or uh, you know even the nifty 100 quality they have underperformed across all these uh, sectors and uh, uh, you know another thing which is visible is that uh, if you look at the smid where we did basically mean the small mid cap uh, uh, you know stocks as a combined and take it as a percentage of market cap on the overall market cap then in all earlier peaks uh, this used to be around 28-30%. As we speak, it's, you know, more than 33-34%. So it's an all-time peak. And these are indications of, uh, you know, market having, uh, you know, a lot of exuberance uh, being visible. Uh, so, uh, you know, coming back to as, uh, uh, you know, I was mentioning, this could be understood by the behavioral bias, uh, uh, which is there. So if you look, uh, you know, uh, uh, economists have in most times gone back to uh, you know, trying to understand stock market through various other, uh, you know, either the sports or some other, uh, uh, you know, gambling activities and so on. So there was a big research report, which, uh, you know, research paper in the uh, academic world, which was done on, uh, you know, trying to study the race schools behavior, uh, like, you know, what, how people behave in um, horse races and, uh, you know, what has been the impact because of that. So there they realized that, you know, in the racing, Typically, everyone, because you're gambling, they're not investing. Everyone loses money. But the point they came out with is that if you know which are the winning horses and which have done well in the last, uh, uh, you know, many years or which the horses which have been winning, and if you were to bet on them, then you don't lose, you know, you, your losses are less. But, you know, most people there go and bet on horses which they don't know or, you know, horses which they think will suddenly win or which have high uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the 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 win reward ratios are very, uh, very high, and they end up actually losing 61%. And, uh, uh, you know, doing further study on that, they have, you know, uh, if you look at the Indian FNO market, this kind of a lottery like kind of behavior is visible where, you know, the regulators or so on have pointed out as to how almost 85 95% people, uh, retail participants are losing money in the option market. And our option market multiple versus the uh, cash market is almost like 400 times versus say 15 uh, to 10 X uh, in developed markets or, you know, on an average around five X. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, if you look at some of these research reports, they've kind of talked about it as a long shot bias and availability bias. So they talk about how, uh, you know, retail investors during these phases, they look for companies where they have lottery like kind of things where, uh, you know, if they go right, then the upside is huge, but they don't focus too much on the probability of that happening uh, to just summarize like you know, they want to buy companies which they think in next two, three years can, you know, one rupee, 100 rupee can become like three, 400 rather than buying something which, you know, uh, could uh, uh, more comfortably, uh, you know, move at like 15, 20% over the next uh, three, four years. And uh, what they, uh, in doing this exercise, what they don't put enough emphasis is on what is the probability of the first one happening and what is the probability of the next one happening. The probability of, you know, doing the first part, which is finding like 10x, 8x and so on, is very low and again is associated more with the lottery-like behavior. The last two, three years market, uh, you know, is not a market which I believe people should extrapolate and assume that, you know, this is the way things would move. Uh, this has been more an exceptional market where, uh, you know, several things have led to it, which is the uh, low base that the COVID formed and post that the revert we saw, uh, you know, how economic uh, activity across board had come down and, uh, you know, several factors led to it. And, uh, uh, you know, as I go further, I, I would like to, you know, bring some topics which suggest that, you know, that is now behind us. So, uh, you know, whenever I speak about it, you know, a lot of people ask me that, you know, this has been visible for the last two, three years. People have talked about it more specifically in the last three, six months. 
uh, but you know we we market even post budget uh, even post results have been strong uh, if you look at the from the bottom of the uh, uh, result time uh, uh, the election results market has like across for small and mid cap gone up more than 20% so i feel now what is, what is happening is you know there are three four both systematic and micro level uh, triggers visible which we feel uh, could you know uh, lead to this change so just to summarize whenever you have a strong momentum of 2 3 years it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint as to when it would turn uh, you can at most time figure out that you know there's excesses happening across but you know uh, the the uh, the how it will shift you, i can you know just talk about some triggers the first trigger i see is the regulatory risk on derivatives the option market the kind of uh, you know excesses we are seeing is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, just uh, difficult to explain uh, many people argue that you know uh, uh, the option market or the derivatives market uh, is limited to some indexes or something or you know it's not uh, impacting but you know to some extent some of these linkages are difficult to explain because uh, so you think about it that you know whenever someone is buying a call there's someone who's selling a call and uh, you know he needs to hedge so uh, you know both uh, i believe that there is some kind of a risk around it and uh, the regulatory uh, body has you know in the last 2 3 years if you look at our regulators they pointed it out as a risk and they've also set a committee on it to kind of recommend the uh, suggestions which would you know uh, uh, safeguard as there's been uh, many research done on it one of the recent research studies suggested that you know the investors the individual investors are losing as much as 1 lakh crore in this and uh, uh, so this is a risk so if the government were to come if the regulator were to come with uh, certain measures to tone down this uh, excess activity here i believe it could lead to uh, some kind of a uh liquidity uh, uh issues in market if we look at you know markets where this has happened in the past it does suggest that you know as in when some of these measures are taken where, uh, you know typically it takes like a series of measures it does have a dampening effect on uh, uh, the high beta or the you know the risk on rally as we call it uh, which is there the other is the policy rebalance by the government post elections i think the likelihood of the same happens significant has increased significantly i'll come to it in my next slide uh the third is again uh, the paper supply is likely to increase significantly uh, while we talk about the kind of inflows we are getting from sip uh, now uh, you know the F, uh, the liquidity flows which are happening i think the uh, the 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 flow part on the side of new issues from uh, you know private equity uh, stocks opening up new issues which were listed in recent times the lock in opening i think that is also very significant and it looks like a tsunami kind of a thing coming from that side the global growth again is a challenge at the micro level i think is more concerning is that if you look at the last 2 3 years the indices even the small mid the earnings growth has been upwards of 20 different uh, categories from say 24 to 30% uh, as we uh, look forward from 24 to 26 this earnings growth looks more like uh, uh, you know 13 14 and you know if you look at on a, uh, a consensus basis the whole range is from say 14% to 16 17% uh, we believe this is very critical because uh, unlike the 2003 to 7 rally where uh, you know the earnings growth was driven by the top line increase uh, the top line also increased at a very strong rate this time uh, between 21 to 24 while earnings grew at upwards of 20% even for nifty the top line growth has been just uh, 10% or lower uh, and so on so this entire uh, uh, you know pat increase has been led by uh, margin improvement which we are seeing signs of you know completely reverting and also the low base effect coming in i'll just show you some data points on this so this is on the index option as to you know how if you look at it since 21 uh it's increased what used to be like a premium uh, you know if you look at it like 4400 crores in 20 is now you know suddenly uh, shot up sharply in 24 and as a result what has happened is if you look at the breakup this is a data from uh, kotak research uh, you know if you look at the options as a percentage of the total options traded globally it's like at an unprecedented level whereas on a open interest it's very small so uh, you know all these things leads to uh, uh, you know uh, challenges on the market which you know sometimes is difficult to realize unless uh, uh, you know they they come out and eventually they play out uh, it, it takes its time to play out but uh, they they never uh, you know good for the market and especially when you have a market which is very risk on very high beta then any uh, curtailment here uh, has a very severe impact on those kind of stocks 
again the same report kind of identifies how uh, you know investors are losing almost like a lakh crore in this uh, segment the other point is the government uh, rural focus so i think post this elections it's become very evident that uh, you know the government has uh, uh, needs to you know refocus on the rural side reach to refocus on the uh, bottom of the market because uh, we are seeing stress there the growth rates even if you look at most of the fmcg other companies most categories whether it's be passenger car two wheelers they they all been sluggish and uh, uh, you know this is evident from the fact that you know if you look at the rural spend that the government does like this is adding up all the a uh, schemes government has then you know from 2.6% and an average of like 1.8 before that has come down to 1.6 whereas capex has increased this is fallen sharply so i think government needs to do uh, uh, something here which again you know would lead to kind of uh, bottom of the market improving which in a way would benefit consumption related stocks would related uh, benefit service related stocks and uh, uh, typically these are the stocks which again have high roes high cash flows and you know you will find more quality uh, uh, company stocks in this segment so i think around the budget time uh, this thing would be more visible and uh, uh, the market shift towards there is happening at a slow pace but this could accelerate as we move forward uh, this is the point i was mentioning on growth uh if you look at uh, uh, post covid obviously during covid time you know the profit overall aggregate profit news died and as and when the economy opened up you saw very strong growth uh, but you know uh, after the last uh, uh, if you look at the last 2 3 4 quarters it's just been declining uh, you know 28% has become 19 to 12 to this year the expected bad growth is 4% and even when we look at a full year basis uh, you know we are talking of uh, like a 14% kind of a growth rate which is nowhere near the 24 25% kind of a bad growth rate that we saw so this combined with the next slide which is the valuations which are high across the board uh, uh, does seem challenging for the market like if you look at uh, you know one of the most rule of thumb metrics that you use for uh, valuation is market cap to uh, uh, gdp and uh, you know this is the data from 2006 and if you see market has never been where it is currently which is almost like 136 uh, Uh, percent of uh, gdp that's the kind of overvaluation we are seeing and i feel uh, that combined with the fact that uh, you know you will have slower growth going forward is is a challenge uh, uh, for the segment because uh, you know particularly if you look at it for companies which are uh, you know below the top 500 Uh, uh you know uh, for the mid cap side and all their multiples are today at almost like upwards of 30% uh, close to 33 34 times versus say an index which is still uh, you know on a forward basis still trading at around 21 20 times so uh, i think uh, th- these are some of the things which could be a possible trigger for uh, you know the current trend of very high beta very deep cyclical turning and market move moving towards quality and when i say quality i would believe that uh, uh, you know while uh, even within quality there are some segments where valuations are very high but i believe there are several pockets of quality which you know the valuations are fairly reasonable bfsi which accounts for a very large proportion of index uh, even otherwise is one such segment where you know valuations are actually at uh, 10 year bottoms uh, and uh, uh, you know similarly some other segments in consumption and so on so we feel that you know this move towards quality should benefit uh, uh, you know us now coming to the snowball effect on investing as to why one should be focused on quality and how uh, you know long term investing instead of uh, uh, trying to look market in a short term basis is what leads to wealth creation there's a old saying that you know there is you should differentiate between income generation and wealth creation for income generation you know when you have a shorter term time frame between 6 months 1 year obviously you need to be very cognizant about which sector will do well you know which stock is going up now which uh, particular uh, uh, you know move or uh, uh, something could lead to a rally there but you know when you think in terms of 3 year 5 year 10 year uh, especially when you are looking at wealth creation what typically is needed is that you find great quality compounders run by great management and then just let them compound don't try and time it uh, uh, in short term periods and that what leads to wealth creation so if you look across history across uh, any uh, you know wealth creation uh, uh, you know firms which have created wealth or individuals which have created wealth uh, you will see most of them have been through uh, this uh, snowball effect on investing where they've taken concentrated bets 
and where over a very long period of time they've compounded to uh, you know such uh, 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 amounts that you know that's how you've created your wealth so within that uh, you know this is now become uh, more focused on how we look for identifying these uh, uh, you know compounding snowball effect companies so one of the things which we really look for is the lendy advantage lindy advantage uh, to put it very briefly is uh, you know a term which was popularized by uh, you know uh, uh, nasim talib who's written several uh, uh, famous books like uh, black swan anti fragile skin in the game and his view was that for non perishable uh, uh, things like you know not uh, like uh, uh, you know uh, whether it be a play or whether it be companies uh, technology the longer something has survived the chances of it surviving for that much more or higher is goes up higher so uh, you know uh, he came up with this thesis with you know when he tried to kind of look at the plays in the uh, you know in, in the us when you look at some of the plays so some plays which you know go on for 200 300 days the chances of them being for another 300 days is higher versus something new which comes in and you know can't even sustain for 3 months so here we look for companies you know which have a, a proven track record uh, companies where uh, you know over long periods of time uh, they have proven uh, uh, that you know they uh, they they've got the competitive advantage they have become monopoly players or they have become duopoly players or uh, you know the moats they have created are multiple and those moats are expanding uh to give you a sense like you know if you look at some of the companies which have uh, on a very long term basis created a lot of wealth in india these are companies which you know are more than 100 years many of them 100 years 80 years since incorporation and even 30 40 years since listing and most of these companies we still uh, talk of them as growth companies so uh, you know when when you are trying to find these kind of compounders thinking in terms of lindy effect is a, a you know great way to kind of uh, identify many of them so if you look at it in terms of current uh, you know in the last 20 years one of the best performers would have been pi industries and uh, you know since incorporation it's almost like 77 years uh, since listing 31 years so when you have this kind of a lendy effect coming in then then you know that you know uh, even going forward uh, these these are companies where uh, uh, the risk is less and the chances of your uh, uh, you know uh, wealth creation goes up more and i uh, to come back to the crux as to where is this difference coming from because you know uh, people typically what they do is uh, they they think that okay these companies have done well but you know how uh, but now they expensive now the issue with them is that you know uh, these companies can grow for a very very long time so the the biggest component in valuation which determines a uh, uh, valuation is the longevity Uh, growth is important but the bigger impact is longevity that you know there are many companies which can grow at 30 40% for 2 3 years 4 years but then often many of them decline 30 40% and you know on a, on a 5 year 10 year basis the growth is subpar but when you find companies which can you know at a, a, a fairly decent rate when i say decent rate which is you know some multiple more than the uh, nominal gdp growth rate if they can grow at that rate for a very very long period of time that's when you uh, see wealth creation happening our focus is to identify such companies and then uh, you know sit on them and uh, 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 you know ride that journey rather than try to identify new ideas or rather to you know keep changing your uh, stocks at every time uh, so uh, one of the things which we think is most important uh, in investing uh, to be able to create wealth is to think in terms of uh, you know uh, what are the things which uh, uh, negates your uh, compounding as we mentioned that you know compounding is the entire magic in uh, uh, investing so if you look at the things you know the mindset which impedes compounding the first one is you know thinking very short term which is next quarter next six months versus thinking in terms of decades uh similarly uh, you know a lot of focus on stock price movement rather than you know on business fundamentals on what are actually driving it uh then you know a lot of uh, uh, uh you know uh, emphasis on action as to you know quickly just when something went up uh, didn't sell it at a top or why you didn't do this rather than you know thinking because market the lesser the action uh, typically you know the long term returns are better the th- uh, you know the fourth one is the comfort of crowd versus independent thinking asset gathering versus focus on long term capital protection and alpha uh, relative performance versus absolute performance the moment uh, if you think of it like you know if a investor in 2006 7 would have said that you know i no matter what uh, i want 
things which will you know uh, do the best relative performance you would have been stuck in uh, uh, you know some of the funds which you know would have uh, you know where sectors and companies which you know had very uh, uh, different kind of results in the next one two years versus if you had focused more in uh, absolute performance basis uh, uh, you know your choices would have been very different so i think this market currently is also one where uh, you know when you think there is excesses happening where there are certain things which are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, like really uh, in terms of you know something which is not sustainable this is not the time to have a mindset of relative uh, performance it's a more a mindset of uh, capital protection and absolute performance because uh, uh, during times of this if you chase relative then you know you will be in places where there is maximum uh, risk of uh, you know losing capital or maximum risk exist uh you know i i have just put this uh, to uh, you know summarize our points as one of the companies where uh, this is most visible so if you look at about india uh, you know i'm just given as, as example as to what we mean by the snowball effect of compounding this is almost like a 100 year old company been listed in you know been in india for more than 75 years been listed for a very long time so it's a mnc company which has actually got all the characteristics of a, a consumer company and uh, you know if you look at it on a 10 year 5 year basis whether it's on the sales whether it's been the pat it has actually done much better than some of the esteemed uh, uh, you know consumer companies which is there whereas on valuation front it would be at at least 20 to 30% discount uh, while having a uh, you know superior roic even in a roe this is one of the few companies which are expanding it uh, even when we compare it with other pharma companies so uh, while it may not be the best growth company if you look at many companies which are growing faster a lot of this growth is coming from the inorganic side so when you look at the actual free cash flow they generate it's very low versus you know if you look here the five year capex is a percentage of ocf for about is just around 4% and you know you can compare it with some of the other companies so uh, you know it would rank number 1 across all the key parameters which really matter for a company Uh, so our idea is to identify uh, you know close to around 18 20 such companies and uh, uh, let them compound over a long period of time uh, coming back to portfolio performance so if you look uh, you know the uh, the points i mentioned to you about quality being under stress is visible in our performance when you look at cy 22 and 23 let me take you through uh, you know how i see uh, Uh, the performance this is a fund we are talking about which is coffee can portfolio which is more than 7 year uh, history today if you look at the first 3 4 years uh, you know the average uh, alpha year has been upwards of 7 8% uh, you know almost 10% in first year close to 10% next year uh, almost 6 7% next year again 7 8% in the year 20 and uh, uh, you know uh, the point i mentioned that you know when you have a covid like or when you have a major issue in the market these are this is where the uh, alpha is gained by funds like this uh, post that when the uh, upsurge happened when uh, you know the high beta rally started these are the two years where we have kind of suffered and we believe we are now coming back on a um, you know as we speak on an inception basis we still uh, are like 1 1 and a half percent higher and uh, the point i was mentioning to you is if you look at on a six months basis and so on uh, this shift towards quality is actually already visible we believe that you know the smart money is already making this shift in a big way now uh, as and when you see some trigger leading to uh, these excesses coming down we believe this uh, trend towards quality this trend towards more uh, long term investing style would you know accelerate in a big way so uh, to kind of you know quickly now summarize the, these were you know some of the points which i meant, wanted to kind of discuss with you all uh, which is you know i'll i'll quickly before i leave it for questions uh, i'll quickly like to summarize i believe that uh, the market in the last 2 3 years which has been driven by a very risk on high beta deep cyclical uh, sectors uh, now you know is reaching a point where i feel there are several triggers which suggest that uh, you know the focus is likely to shift back to quality and uh, uh, capital protection and investors today would do better to you know uh, kind of uh, moderate their return expectations think more in terms of uh, absolute performance rather than in uh, hyper uh, excesses segment trying to beat the uh, the segment which is you know really uh, uh, going hyper the other is uh, 
that we believe that uh, you know that uh, several ways you can make mark money in the market we uh, at ambit or you know we at coffee can fund this particular fund our focus is on one particular style which is very long term oriented low churn uh, buying companies with high roes high free cash flow great management and the idea is to sit through them over a long period of time we believe this is the way uh, long term wealth is created so just like uh, uh, you know in investing when you do you have some large cap some mid and small we believe even in investing there are different investing styles and uh, there are times when one investing style does better at other different one does and uh, uh, you know investors who want to look at investing style which is quality focused long term oriented we believe this is a fund even in the most volatile or the segment where you know it was very difficult to follow it we followed it and uh, you know we are uh, continue to pursue this style and we think the time for this fund is uh, coming uh, back so uh, with this i will uh, you know now leave uh, uh, the presentation uh, and uh, leave leave the floor for uh, any questions and answers that uh, questions that you may have thank you sir that was an insightful uh, uh, ppt i must say um so before we could start on the other part of the uh, questions the one quick question that i had on my mind is that in today's world where the you know the uh, fund managers uh, you know are uh, looking out for the opportunities all four quadrants like quality growth value everything but this particular fund is focusing only on quality and of course uh, you see the trend in quality moving forward i accept that but there are market doesn't remain the same so do you feel that there are chances of this fund missing the opportunity when quality doesn't do good so uh, akshara when when i say quality uh, you know obviously i mean quality growth companies because you know uh, when you say quality uh, you typically mean companies which uh, will have longevity of the growth is a key focus rather than trying to find companies which could you know do very well in quality uh, growth on a one year two year basis like deep cyclicals and so on so uh, you you are right uh, uh, this is the topic of the uh, uh, you know webinar as well that there's cyclicality in investing i believe that you know as investors mature just like they have different pockets for large cap mid cap small cap they will have different allocations for different kind of style of investing just like you put money in fd you also put money in uh, some uh, funds where you think they are very aggressive some which are less aggressive so i believe the there is a niche market for funds like us uh, for uh, you know funds like uh, uh, ambit coffee can and for our style of investing and we want to be the uh, you know the predominant or you know we, we want to make a space for ourselves there and uh, we believe this style is coming back so you are right that you know uh, uh, you know no no style does well across the period but the, uh, if you remember you know i showed you this slide that across all cycles quality has done better it's only during times of hyper moves that you know quality underperforms uh, which was more like 91 to 94 or say 2003 to 7 and peers like that and let, let me give you one um, a quick uh, you know uh, take it with a little bit of humor but uh, you know how many people you know who would say that you know between 2004 and 7 uh, our fund did that well and you know what led to it where these are the stocks which led to it uh, uh, you know when those excesses happen uh, does anyone say that you know the the stocks which subsequently fell 90% do, do they say that okay we did well because these were the stocks we owned uh uh you know you know so so uh, i mean just keep that in um, uh, uh mind that you know typically markets the long term returns have been 14 15% over uh, 30 years 20 years so to have expectations that you know even after 2 3 years of strong rally it will keep giving you 30 60 70% returns is uh, uh, uh you know uh, expectation which may not uh, uh, hold true because you know the economics will not add up your nominal growth we know what it is and uh, uh, you know even the earnings growth as i mentioned is more like 13 14% so uh, 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 so i believe that quality growth investing style which is focus on long term uh, longevity of growth great management when you talk of cycles because when you are saying you want to hold and create wealth over 5 10 year you need a style which will do well uh, over that 10 year period and uh, uh, so this is this is one of the style which uh, uh, you know as 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 the slide mentioned 88% of the time they outperform so yes uh, you're right it could have uh, peers like the one we have had in 22 23 but yeah. we believe that would be uh, you know very uh, 
I know uh, smaller sense. than longer. Phase. I understand, sir. Thank you for clearing it out. And when you say this fund has a long term perspective, long term investing style, today's investors are well informed and you know uh, well aware about the markets. So they check on their portfolio or a dashboard on a regular basis. When they go to see if the fund or portfolio is not performing uh, as per the market, because they come here for making alpha. If they're not perfect, they immediately they panic and they reach out to the uh, uh, fund managers. So have you ever encountered such uh, investors? And if at all, if yes, what would be your answer on that? No, we encounter that uh, uh, issue all the time. Uh, there are so, so you know fortunately most of our investors who are invested in this kind of a fund have that kind of a thinking but yes. within that there are people uh you know who have been caught so the point is see as, as i mentioned you know uh this is an issue which we are facing uh across not just uh, uh you know th this is the the uh, whole uh outlook has become shorter and shorter term so i think uh you know there have been many fund uh you know which have mentioned like if you were to ask for one um, factor which would give you the maximum opportunity to create uh, alpha like you know one factor which is which will allow you to create maximum alpha is that you know the moment you start thinking in terms of more than a year uh so uh so you know there are two styles one is uh, income generation one is uh, the wealth creation you you can uh, you know with that perspective you can only do more like income because you know you are shifting from here to there and and, and you know as long as the rally goes good and when it uh, the downsides there are often uh, severe so one of the things which you know we uh, kind of wrote in our communication is that the reason this investor behavior has happened is that in the last two three years we have seen very shallow drawdowns and we've hardly seen any volatility so you know it's become almost like uh, that okay you know just through through five ten percent and market comes back but uh, we, you know anyone who has a uh, uh, experience in the markets of say 10 15 20 years and more know that you know markets can be volatile drawdowns can be very sharp and uh, uh, you know that's when you appreciate uh, uh, the some some of these aspects so um, the uh, I'll just take one more uh, minute on that. So yes. if you look at the number of DMAT accounts which were there in 2000 versus this today, uh, the bulk of the new investors, you know, they don't have uh, a lot of uh, investing experience in terms of like they may have made a lot of money in the last three years, but they may not necessarily have because, you know, the, the DMAT openings have been uh, have gone up 5x in the last uh, four years itself. So, uh, uh, you know, across the cycle, maybe they'll appreciate this more. And as I mentioned that, you know, one of the advantages of a PMS or one, as, as you know, uh, uh, just like in a market or something, as the, uh, uh, you know, investors mature, as uh, they become more sophisticated, I think, you know, this uh, subtle uh, aspect about, uh, you know, difference between income generation and wealth creation and the necessity of long term thinking becomes more and more apparent. Yeah, that's when the answer comes in for power of compounding as well. Absolutely. So the more uh, the more you get in uh, stay investors, the more is the compounding power. Um, but said that uh, the next major, uh, um, you know, uh, the event which people are awaiting, the market is awaiting is the budget, the final budget of 2024. So how do you think that would affect the market? What are your takes on it? Yeah, so I think in this budget, uh, as I mentioned, one of the things which will clearly come out is, uh, uh, you know, I, I would believe the government would have to uh, focus more on the bottom of the market, more on um, the rural distress, which is there. Uh, so many of the things, uh, you know, there's been an interim budget, they may not be a major uh, difference between this and that. But, you know, this is one aspect where government may want to focus more because, uh, you know, the market recovery has been very K-shaped and uh, uh, the distress is there to be uh, seen you know uh, it's visible across uh, growth rates in um, uh, you know across categories uh, uh, you cannot have uh, you know a, a, a growth economy or a low you know a, a developing economy where you know the passenger car growth is what it is which is you know low uh, a single digit uh, i mean not even uh, like four five percent kind of a growth rate so some of these things are even you know when you look at two wheelers two wheelers today the sales is less than what it was in 2019 so many of these things are, does suggest to you that uh, you know the bottom of the market there has been issues so uh, uh, you know any move there should benefit companies uh, uh, you know which are more aligned with that so that is one thing we think will be uh, the most apparent in this budget
Yeah. So I'll just add a question to it. Uh, the same question you asked uh, from Sampath. He has the same question on budget, but uh, the add on question was like, uh, my allocations are more towards small cap EMS. So should I shift it to large cap? Because this fund is a large cap uh, fund. So I want to take this question up. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, our uh, our sense is that, you know, uh, small caps do create uh, long term wealth. And that's that's the area where you can find many multi baggers. Yeah. But uh, we, we have a view that, you know, in the last two, three years, the uh, there's been some excesses in that segment. And those uh, uh, both the mid and small day to day uh, looking a bit expensive. Uh, relatively, we feel there is more opportunities in large cap, but I think having a right mix of say a 70, 30 or 75, 25, uh, there's been many academic research done, which suggests that that's what gives you the best uh, uh, risk adjusted return. Uh, so in a time like this, where we think there is more, uh, uh, you know, capital safety or, you know, more uh, value on the large cap side, I think some tilt towards there is something one should uh, consider because, uh, you know, uh, the, the, anyway, uh, 70, 30 kind of a mix is what uh, gives you the best uh, 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 risk adjusted uh, long term returns. True. And when you talk about returns of coffee can, June has been a very volatile month for equity markets, you know, starting from the exit polls and then we had elections and post elections. We could see a uh, market was already uh, 6% to 7% up uh, post the elections. And, uh, you know, uh, the returns which was given by a uh, coffee can was around uh, approximately 5% uh, to approximately 4.5% 4 4 when the benchmark has done 6 so uh, why was this underperformance if you want to address it sir yeah so i think you know what we saw is that immediately post the uh, election results again we saw a resumption in the very high risk on and very high beta uh, rally and in that rally you know many of the uh, contributors were capital goods or you know many deep cyclicals and th those were the segments which went up very sharply and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, we were not participants within that so i think uh, that that's one of the reasons where we could have seen but if you look at uh, on, a, on a period on a slightly longer term period where we have started seeing the shift over the la like when i say uh, some more months like if you look at the march to this uh, you know there's been like on a six months basis we are uh, you know having four five percent kind of a uh, so this trend is visible and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, we feel that as uh, this is something you know which is now reaching a stage where you would see the shift happening more uh, decisively okay and uh, this fund was originally uh, managed by i know other fund some other fund manager was who was into ambit and now it is you have entered into this fund so what changes have you brought to this fund yeah, so I took this fund, uh, I took over this fund in December uh, and uh, post that, you know, we tried to, uh, uh, there have been some changes that we did and, uh, you know, one of the things which we did is that, uh, uh, you know, earlier the the our investing universe was a bit small because, uh, you know, uh, we, we uh, they were using some quant methods uh, it alone. Uh, we realized that, you know, 80% of the way we choose a company is qualitative. So we made it like, you know, 30%, which would, uh, uh, you know, be uh, more focused on the qualitative aspects and also try to be, uh, you know, this would allow us to be in segments where we think uh, that, you know, more uh, 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 younger companies or more high growth companies could be had. So if you look at a life cycle of a company, uh, you know, if you have very stringent uh, uh, quant based filters, then, you know, uh, uh, and not focus too much on the qualitative when you're building your universe, we were missing that. So we kind of tried to uh, bridge that. And uh, subsequently, obviously, uh, uh, you know, the performance has uh, improved, like the, uh, to give you a sense, like, you know, some of the changes we did would have resulted in like a eight to 10% kind of an alpha versus what the uh, stocks were there. So those things are done. Uh, uh, there's no major uh, change as such. That was a small tinkering that we needed to do more with the way we, uh, you know, built our universe. And uh, we, we think that, you know, uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, funds like this are not so much uh, manager uh, uh, linked to some extent because, you know, it's more philosophy of long term uh, holding uh, quality companies. So we think, uh, uh, you know, to that as to, to that uh, uh, um, uh, in that manner, there has not been any major uh, change. Okay. Um, so I'll take one question from Amit Kar. Is that um, uh, stock markets here seeming 
is not moving in a tandem with the uh, gen uh, general public sentiments. Suppressed growth numbers, shaky US elections, volatile uh, South China Sea, etc. How do you see the market behaving in next six to seven months? Uh, you know, US elections. So my sense is that if you look at this financial year, may, we may have seen the best, uh, uh, you know, some somewhere behind us. And um, going forward, it would be a little bit challenging because as I mentioned, the growth rates are moderating. Uh, the valuations are very high and uh, you know there is uh, uh, there's several pockets of uh, excesses happening and uh, i i did mention to you know there's certain aspects like the regulatory thing on the derivatives which you know we think uh, the the regulators already kind of uh, aware of the issue they've kind of pointed it out and globally we have seen that you know when things have reached to such unsustainable levels they've been forced to take uh, uh, measures so you know some of these aspects the the shift from um, on the government side uh, so these these would be things which would you know maybe moderate returns uh, in the near term and uh, uh, you know on a long term basis uh, it would still be good because you know if you look at the compounding of the indian market it's around 15 16% which is what uh, we are enjoying but uh, uh, maybe the excesses of last 2 3 years is something which i don't think uh, uh, you know would uh, sustain um, uh, from you okay now, i think now. that has answered amit's question and uh, the one question which is following at the podium from nilesh was that uh, what are your views on sectors are uh, you know dictatorial uh, dictatorial bets in india so what uh, themes or sectors are, are you bullish upon yeah so you know if you look at uh, the uh, the sectors which have given you the ma maximum multi baggers uh, over 10 years 20 years 30 years uh, those sectors have more or less, uh, uh, you know, at different points remain the same. They, they've been sectors from the consumer side, they've been sectors from technology, from pharmaceutical, uh, you know, when I say consumer, consumer discretionary. These are the three, four uh, uh, sectors which, you know, have given you the maximum multi baggers on a 10 year, 20 year basis. So uh, our, uh, uh, you know, leaning also is uh, around that the financials, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the consumer side. Uh, the pharma and the technology these these are the sectors within that you will have sub segments like uh, uh, you know um, on the consumer side earlier you may not have anything like say a zomato or something now you have something like that so when we say finance earlier uh, you know finance would have meant only lending companies but now we also have a amc listed so in our fund we have an hdfc amc uh, we have a, a, a you know another uh, capital infrastructure play so uh, you know the, these are these are some of the plays uh, and uh, 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 so they still remain within the broader category of finance though subcategory wise you would uh, make a difference so i think they will still be in these uh, uh, three to four which is finance uh, uh, technology uh, your pharma and the consumer okay when you talk about stocks and high quality you no know, the coffee can emphasize on investing on franchise which has superior tax record which is over 10 years on the other hand you have your top five holdings as new age companies like zomatos yes so isn't that a bit contradicting so if you want to answer that yeah so this was one of the changes we uh bought in so what we said is that you know uh when you invest in a company uh it's a uh you know that you look at the qualitative aspects you look at the quantitative aspects and uh, you uh, you know when you look at the life cycle of a company which is from a young company to you know high growth to growth company to uh, you know more like a moderate growth and then the declining company what happens is that you know there are many sectors where uh, uh, you know the the high growth companies and all come and they may not have very high uh, long history but on a qualitative aspects they are showing you all the uh, uh, you know indications of being a a uh, 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 gr great uh, wealth creator so in case of zomato if you look you know it's a uh, you know well formed duopoly it's very difficult to break this duopoly the uh, opportunity size is huge uh, you know if i were to add blanket and food you're talking of an opportunity size uh, which could be you know the larger market is like almost 800 billion 700 billion so when you're talking of such a large market uh, play where uh, you know someone has kind of created a uh, hold where they are like you know almost a duopoly player in one segment maybe a, a oligopoly player uh, or the bigger oligopoly player in the uh, the second business of theirs so these are businesses we wanted to be uh, uh, you know a bit early in so that's what one of the changes we did is we said 30 percent of our portfolio holdings will be with a forward looking nature to call uh, you know uh, quality so when we say quality we don't want it to be backward looking alone uh, we wanted 30% of our portfolio to be what we said is forward-looking quality, where we think these are the next uh, emerging 
what you call the CCP companies. So within that 30% basket, we had companies like say, uh, uh, you know, if I can mention it, uh, like uh, uh, one capital infrastructure play, wherein we had Kfin, uh, then, you know, we had uh, uh, Concord Biotech, which is again, though it has history, listing wise, it's young, then Zomato. So this, this is the key change we bought into the uh, portfolio. And you're right, in amongst our top holdings, uh, because of the appreciation, the stocks moved up like 60-70%. Uh, you know, a 5% position has become large for us today. And uh, uh, it's appearing amongst our top five today. And also, uh, to talk on the new uh, new age tech companies, there are always uh, technology advance, uh, advancements and disruptions um, factor analyzes into quality stocks. Is there any specific technology or innovations that you're uh, particularly optimistic about? Yeah, across the board. So I think uh, sadly, like, you know, in India may not have, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, when you look at the AI, uh, when you look at many of the other segments, they, they are really changing the way, uh, you know, you would look at uh, many of the businesses in future. So what we try and find is like, you know, if you have someone uh, uh, with, you know, which meets all your characteristics and all, we would love to have it. But uh, in the event, like say, just in a uh, case in point, if I'm not finding a perfect kind of a play for my AI, instead of having a suboptimum play there, uh, what we are seeing is the beneficiaries of that. So if you look at someone like a Zomato, I think, you know, this entire move towards, uh, uh, you know, the e-com within that, how an AI or how a data driven um, uh, businesses could benefit, it could be one of the examples. So just like earlier, when you look at in the past, when, uh, you know, technology came in, when internet came in, there are many businesses which came up, which were not necessarily hardware driven companies or pure uh, uh, tech companies. But, you know, the ones who were able to use those technology in a good way, uh, sometimes uh, emerge much bigger winners. So similarly, in India, we, we currently are finding more companies which will benefit disproportionately uh, from this uh, uh, because, we, we, you know, we don't have players like Nvidia or, you know, someone like, a, 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 you know, those, those kind of plays here. Uh, so that's how we are playing this. True. And also, uh, when you talk on market, market doesn't remain the same, as said. And there are, uh, there are the days where markets are very volatile. So how, how, how do you protect your downside? And is there any risk mitigation uh, techniques that you use for this particular portfolio? Absolutely. So, you know, here there is this point about, you know, there's this story about how, uh, you know, when there is, uh, you know, like Talib talks about, like, let me give you Talib's this thing. He says that, you know, in a black swan, uh, when it comes, you cannot, you, you have to be prepared for it for all the time. The, the very nature of black swan is such that, you know, you wouldn't know when it will come. So a lot of people say that, look, right now, market trend is this, let's be in this, as in when we see some issue, then, you know, we'll change our style. But the point is that uh, the nature of black swan is such that you cannot predict it. So you have to be ready for it every day. Uh, uh, so when someone asks me why one needs to be, uh, you know, always thinking of capital protection first before returns or why this focus on quality, my answer is simple that, you know, investors have given us money for this kind of investing with a primary focus on capital protection. So I uh, need to think in terms of, you know, the black swan kind of risk at all time. I cannot uh, uh, have it as an X uh, uh, thing that, okay, we are prepared for known risk. But as and when that happens, we will uh, take a shift. So uh, to, 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 you know, uh, that's uh, if you look at how is the long term wealth created, it is by, you know, uh, outperforming in downturns. If you have two, three years where you've done very well, but in a downturn, you fall 70, 80 percent. Then, you know, if you do a basic maths where, you know, you're going up 100 percent, 50 percent, 40 percent, but then you take a nose down 60 percent versus something which is managed more like a 15, 20, 20 percent, the 15, 20 percent, just like, a, a, you know, the uh, the old story would outperform. So our idea is that we are always prepared for a black swan event and uh, um, uh, you know, the uh, for preparing yourself for such an event, you need to be uh, investing in that particular way. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, it's unlikely that, you know, just a month before it's happening, you will get to know and you will change your whole portfolio. That typically uh, is a miracle. That would be a miracle. And only, uh, you know, either uh, uh, someone is a magician or someone is a liar. So <laughs> those are the two people who will be able to do it. <laughs> That is not actually possible. So, so uh, on that, um, we have already completed six months into this uh, year. And moving forward, how have you, you know, positioned your portfolio in next six months? Yeah, so I think we have positioned uh, it, uh, you know, as I mentioned, one is we, we first looked at it in terms of life cycles. So earlier we realized we were more focused on 
uh, you know, companies which were, uh, you know, on the growth or a little bit on the matured growth side. So we made this tilt towards having 30% of our portfolio, which what we call is young growth companies, much higher growth companies. So on a growth quotient, uh, we've, you know, uh, firstly got a, a much higher growth uh, 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 orientation for the entire fund. The other thing we have done is that, you know, we've had unique plays within each uh, verticals, like say in consumer. Now we have, uh, as I mentioned, say like a Zomato. Similarly, in our financials, uh, you know, while we have 30% weight in financials, our larger uh, weights in many are in segments, which, you know, are uh, non-lending companies, uh, whether it be a capital infrastructure play, whether it be a asset management play, uh, similarly, when you look at uh, uh, in terms of uh, technology, uh, we are trying to play it in a slightly uh, different way with, uh, uh, you know, some of the plays which gives us uh, access where, you know, they are like 90% plus market share, where they are benefiting in a big way indirectly from this entire uh, data driven technology thing. So that's that's one of the things. So I think we moved up on the uh, uh, growth side and I would believe also on the uh, quality quotient on that. And largely the fund has remained more or less, uh, you know, other than the uh, few changes that we have done, but the broader, uh, 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 you know, the fund remains, many of our old winners have been there since inception and mm -hmm. that continues to be the case. Okay. Um, so because of time constraint, I need to have only one question to be asked. That's a complete a personal question from my end. The, sure. That you spoke about books, uh, if, if at all, if you want to recommend one book to the investor, yeah. Uh, to read about the markets, who is completely new to the market. So what would, what book would that be? Yeah. So, I mean, see, one of the things about book is that you don't necessarily need to, you know, buy the, uh, you read the latest book. Some of, you know, the older the books are, again, the Lindy effect comes, the more, uh, you know, the old the book is and so on. Uh, you, sometimes the wisdom there is more. So obviously intelligent investor and all are there, but you know, what I do is like, you know, I often have, uh, you know, from my family and uh, other people asking me this question and I first, uh, get them to get on something like a Peter Lynch and so on, you know, who's like, uh, uh, you know, his investing style was something which, you know, they can comprehend much easier and he explains it in a much, much uh, easier manner. And uh, so, you know, uh, some of the books by Peter Lynch, uh, then, you know, the letters by Warren Buffett, uh, and then you move to uh, Intelligent Investor and so on. So that, that would be my... Um, uh, suggestion like you know start with you know understand how exciting investing could be read the letters from uh, uh, mr buffett which is there freely available uh, start with the 2008 where it explains the great good this this is the suggestion i've always give you know the basic thing as to when you talk of investing what is a great business which is a good what is a gruesome business start from uh, something like that and so on so th those would be some of the books i would mention Thank you, sir. With that, we've come to the end of the session. Of course, there are a lot of questions which has already fallen to the podium, which I was not able to take it on air. These questions will be mailed to you. I would request you to answer them okay. so that uh, these questions are also answered offline. We'll be taking all these questions offline as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do and, thank you. and thank you for this insightful presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, thanks to all the, uh, you know, uh, 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 all the listeners. Thanks so much for your valuable time. Thank you so much. Thank you.